Hey all, Ron here from Military Images Magazine with a new episode of Life on the Civil War Research Trail. Today we're going to go to April 2nd, 1865. I'm going to take you to the depleted ranks, the remnant of the 2nd Maryland Infantry, Confederate 2nd Maryland, and a small band of Confederate artillerymen who were making a last-ditch effort to stop the Yankee Army from breaking through the defenses of Richmond and Petersburg. The small band of Confederates manned two field guns and fired grape and canister at the advancing bluecoats. Normally, the firing of guns like this would have a significant impact, but not this time. It had no noticeable effect. The U.S. soldiers, overwhelming numbers just kept on coming. They overwhelmed the Marylanders' position in a hand-to-hand -hand fight, a rarity during the Civil War. One of the small band of Marylanders who lined up that day and received the attack of the advance of the Union Army, he's pictured here. His name is Henry Gerard Robertson. He was a private in the ranks of Company B. He hailed from Charles County, Maryland and he had joined the second in the summer of 1862. He made it through all the engagements of the regiment without any major physical harm. Robertson survived the Second Battle of Winchester, during which the regiment participated in numerous charges and also the capture of Star Fort and its garrison of U.S. soldiers. Robertson survived the Battle of Gettysburg, where they were trapped in horrific fighting in the thick of the action along Culp's Hill on July 2nd and July 3rd. Serious casualties. Somehow Robertson escaped. Then as the Battle of Cold Harbor, Robertson was there. The Marylanders captured guns and turned them on the U.S. forces, mowing them down with canister fire from their own guns, survived all of this, survived the siege of Petersburg when the regiment was eventually depleted by casualties and injuries into just a whisper of what it was when it started out in that summer of 1862. This brings us and Robertson to April 2nd, 1865, that fateful day when the Confederate Army could no longer defend the capital, Richmond, and Petersburg. To give you a feel for what Robertson and his comrades in the Second Maryland encountered that day, I want to read you a passage from a book called The Maryland Line in the Confederate Army, 1861 to 1865, by William Worthington Goldsboro. He's a veteran served with the Marylanders. So here's that passage, a quote, at daylight on the morning of April 2nd, 1865, the second was ordered to form. There was an indescribable something in everyone's presence that portended of evil. What could it be? It was true that the soldiers of Lee's army had revolved the situation in their minds more than once, but then, as long as Mars Bob was there, all seemed right. But Mars Bob could not build up armies without material, and alas, that once glorious army was fast dwindling away through desertion and casualties. It seemed to those devoted troops that the second day of April morning that the whole federal army had been let loose. Everywhere was heard the roar of artillery and the rattle of musketry. That handful of men composing the Army of Northern Virginia was now but a pygmy battling with a giant. And still, that pygmy had not been much of greater proportions for many months, and yet the giant had not before ventured an attack along the line. But the end was fast approaching, and the end was as glorious as the beginning. In this whirl of excitement, the second Maryland seemed to be ubiquitous. It was first ordered here, and then there, 
And although its physical strength was not great, the example it set and the moral effect of its prompt and immediate obedience to orders made an impression. Finally, General William McComb ordered Captain John W. Torch to hold a certain line of works. And he said, and I will try to form the brigade on you. It was the last order given to the Second Maryland by General McComb. They formed in line, and some of the men, assisted by a few men of the battery, ran two guns of Purcell's battery into position and opened a fire of grape and canister upon the approaching enemy, then not over 300 yards distant. But that avalanche of men pressed on with resistless energy and soon were swarming inside the Confederate works. McCone's brigade seemed at sea, and the only command intact in it was the Second Maryland. Foot by foot, they resisted the encroachment of the enemy, but such an unequal contest could not long endure. Fiercely, the contest waged, and muskets were clubbed and crashed into human skulls, but all in vain. Captain Ferdinand Duval, with Lieutenants John Polk, William Zollinger, William Bias, and Charles Wise, with about 30 men, were unable to escape from the works and were captured. The remainder escaped in two different squads, one under Captain Torch and the other under nobody, but the latter, meeting remnants of the 17th and 14th Tennessee regiments, a portion of the old brigade, united with them and made for the north bank of the Appomattox River, which all succeeded in attaining by means of two flat bottom boats found along the river. This remnant rested that night after a march of eight or ten miles, and a weary lot they were. On the morning of the third, this fragment of this once famous brigade, the Marylanders, assembled and determined upon some sort of organization. Upon looking over the brave little band of Maryland boys, it was discovered that there were 23 muskets present and not a commissioned officer. Now, you may be wondering about Private Henry Gerard Robertson. He was not one of the 23 men. At some point in the day, we're not sure when. It may have happened before they fired the guns, the grape and canister on the Union soldiers that would not stop coming. It may have happened during the fighting in the Confederate entrenchments when clubs were flinging around, muskets flinging around as cubs, clubs, hand-to-hand -hand fighting. We don't know when he fell, but at some point he did. A mini ball struck him in the chest in his left lung. It was his first wound in battle in almost three years. Robertson was taken somehow. He got taken to the Fairground Hospital in Petersburg. Wasn't much it could do for him. They gave him a simple dressing. I don't know if they gave him any drugs, anything to drink. We don't know. But we do know that the next day, Richmond and Petersburg fell. It was on April 3rd, 1865. And Robertson and his fellow patients were now prisoners of war. Six days later, on April 9th, as Robertson lingered, prisoner of war Robertson lingered in a hospital bed, that little band of 23 Marylanders, whatever was left of them, surrendered at Appomattox Courthouse, surrendered by Mars Bob. Less than two weeks later, on April 22nd, Robertson breathed his last. He was about 23 years old. He was buried on the hospital grounds and later removed to Baltimore's Loudon Park Cemetery. So thanks for listening. See you on the next episode of Life on the Civil War Research Trail.